I have to upload it. Oh, 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 this is on the screen after the recording. Sorry, are you guys uh, having a tipple? Or? Yes. I'm having a cup of tea. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, well, what can we say about Jung? He was a student of Freud, wasn't he? Um, and I thought it was a very interesting text. Mm. I just wanted to say, reading it, I, I found myself feeling a bit stirred up. But I think I always feel like that when I read psychoanalysis for some reason. And it's funny because there's a part of me that doesn't want to give it too much belief. <laughs> but I always feel really stirred up when I'm reading it. And I find myself going off on these like reveries and having these free associations. So I think it's almost like reading a book of black magic or something sometimes when you read this material. What did you guys think? Well, I mean, I, I enjoyed it. Um, and I, I think the emphasis kind of shifted through the three chapters that we had. So at first, he seems to be just presenting Freud's worldview as as kind of standard in a sense but then you realize he's not really and then he brings in the Adlerian variant or, or sort of competing view um, and and presents them as kind of um, contraries I suppose not exactly opposites but contraries or alternatives um, and and has his, uh, his own analysis of that and leads him to postulate the introvert and extrovert dichotomy which was kind of interesting and I, I didn't know whether this was the first time that it had been um, presented so yeah it's a it's a very interesting text um, and in a sense to see to see Jung analyzing <laughs> analyzing um, these these two giants of the genre is uh, instructive I guess and and uh, the other thing the only other thing I'd say is that Courtney and I kind of messaged when we were reading it about, <laughs> you know, there are elements of the case studies that remind us of um, novels from the era because, you know, they're all about these rich Viennese families with their servants and their and their young ladies with their neuroses. <laughs> and, but at the same time, maybe the, um, the case studies are, are far less nuanced than the fiction of the time, you know, you've, a novel by Henry James, say, or, or George Eliot, is treats it as kind of similar situations, but with a lot more nuance. So that's another element to to think of with all this. Mm. Dirty. Oh yeah, look, I um I haven't. I've got a few Jung titles on my shelf that are still um neatly not opened. You know, um so this was a good introduction for me I've read articles about him over the years but not his own writing very much so this was great to um, hear his voice even if it's translated but still um, and yes just to see him talking about his this because uh, Freud was so important to him for such a long time too wasn't he he was really instrumental to his uh, development of his own work I imagine and um, and then the way he tackles Nisha is really good. I enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think, Vincent? Um, <clears throat> so I only really read the first chapter and start on the second. Um, and yeah, um, you know, as you comment, Judith, you can see how um, it does lend itself to sort of like a work of fiction or you know literature about this kind of uh, intrigue and these sort of um very pampered circles that they lived um and it seemed a little ridiculous how someone could be so you know running in front of some horses and not moving and then there was an example of people being mowed down by soldiers in saint petersburg it's like whoa you know um but uh yeah i i found it very interesting how he drew back on like uh diagnosis if i'm saying this right diagnosis you know what I mean, the or whatever. Yeah, those instances. And just trying to, when I'm reading it, thinking about how common this sort of thing is in today's society. And it was really interesting how they talked about, he talked about, sorry, um, suppressing our uh, animal desires to fit into culture. And it seems all that much, 
well, the the constraints of culture seem all that more extreme in those days in those social circles than the ones I know now. So, you know, living in a middle class New Zealand society, like probably it is similar for you guys, then, you know, you can choose how much you want to cut loose and, you know, indulge in whatever sexual fantasies or other hedonistic things. There's not as many controls. But you can also live a more of a pure life in a sense. I think there's more freedom to choose. So that, you know, having these hysteria things that are built on repression, like suppressing your natural desires because of culture seem less common. Um, but I do know one young lady who seems to live in that sort of situation because she has a very repressive and authoritarian mother that she's unable to escape. And she works in a, um, a science lab and her world is extremely small. and it, I, you know, <coughs> examples of um, the, the patients that Jung treated and Freud uh, bring to mind her instance, you know. So, yeah. Um, hmm. May I, I just thought of something too, if I can just jump in quickly. What I found, I just finished reading the, the Nisha one before we started, and the very last part of it, um, he, he goes into a bit of a thoughtful discussion on the nature of love and and hopefully we'll get to that um in the course of the discussion i just thought it was really interesting in mm. the way he was talking about we'll about get love. to that that's mm. um very important yeah Travis. and then he oh sorry oh, sorry he just commented at the end of the first chapter that you know it's love as opposed to trauma that can really trigger these um episodes mm. and these um neurological complexes but it must be both and i think you can put the two together and say you know trauma and love you know these yeah. sorts of things whether it's sexual abuse at a young age or a flaunted love relationship all sorts of things that seems to be part of the point he said something about um there's a traumatic event but it's paired with some unconscious conflict with the with the love instinct in the background which which causes it to take root or something so yeah anyway um travis what do you think uh, i read chapter one and it was a very interesting read i did like the start of it because to me it follows a more logical perspective around trauma and then if we're looking at how one might be predisposed predisposed to certain things um, it goes into the previous history of the trauma, which to me makes complete sense, even with the example that was given around, you know, you've got this person that might be fine in in being able to deal with like a lot of blood as an example, but then the the horse with the cabman comes down the street and then they're gone, linking in that history of um, being on that horse when they had to like jump off. I'm like that to me, I was like, oh, that makes complete sense, like case closed. So the introduction then of this further unresolved element in your subconscious through like the love um, was very interesting to me. I it really was a big leap for me to accept what was put forward around that element, particularly with like Mr. A and Mr. B um, that, that came in later on. So it was interesting um, still sitting on it. Hmm. All right, we'll quickly jump in then. So, Judith, you're right. I, I picked this um, reading because it said the first three chapters were a kind of background summary of psychoanalysis before before Jung put together his, his ideas. So he's obviously influenced by Freud's um, main kind of thesis around um, erotic conflict or um, unconscious conflict and Adler's idea of the the will to power um, and of course Nietzsche is kind of the case study in that section isn't he um, so the first part really talks about a bit of a um, history of neuroses following um, what's his name Pierre Yanet I'm not sure how you pronounce that French name um, and Charcot and and these guys were really important because they had a lot to do with hypnosis and um, and talk therapies, uh, like really early kind of prototypical talk therapy. And and they, I think it mentions here, right, that they 
one of them found that through the use of hypnosis or twilight states, um, when the person would recount some hidden memory, they would they would experience relief for a brief period of time from their um, neurotic, neurotic symptoms. Um, so that, I guess, um, sparked Freud's interest in, in the subject. And I read that it was, I think it was um, Pierre Yanet who invented the term subconscious. Um, so obviously, um, I think the point you make there, um, Travis, about why, why, why not just trauma? Why does there have to be some other thing preceding it? I think he asked that question in here, doesn't doesn't he? He says, um, he says, it was not known how a historic a hysterical symptom originates in the psyche. The psychic causal connections were completely unknown. So it wasn't good enough to to kind of say, this was my takeaway. I'm kind of trying to read through my notes quickly, but basically the idea seemed that um, why doesn't everybody, given a traumatic kind of situation, spawn these kind of neurotic situations? You know, they have these neurotic symptoms develop. Could it be something inherent? And so this must be obviously earlier than genetic theories. Nowadays, we'd say a person has a has a traumatic reaction. I think they call it the diathesis stress model. Something traumatic happens, and it and and there's a underlying genetic component, and and the, together they trigger mental health situation or whatever. But in this case, they're not talking about genetics, are they? Which is interesting, though, because he'll say, "Well, the mother had a similar kind of situation," but instead they 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 they're talking instead about psych psychic conflict intra-psychic conflict and throughout these three chapters we get the idea that freud really focuses on one particular kind of instinct which is at the cause of most of these conflicts um i think it gets called the id it doesn't get called that in here and it's called eros in here and it's the life instinct in general and he says in this chapter that freud towards the end realized the limit of the scope of just relying on that one instinct and inst and and introduce the death the death instinct um as a kind of counterpoint to that but you can feel that um do you agree with this you get the feeling that um that jung raises an eyebrow at that he kind of thinks it's a bit too simplistic and he's he thinks there's something more going on um you got any points that you'd like to make around any of those Um, just that you, I think you're absolutely right, Courtney. I think there, there is an eyebrow being raised at a lot of things here. Um, and I did notice, and, and I can't quite remember where it is, but Jung refers to um, Diotima's speech in the symposium about Eros. And that reminds us that he did have um, Plato in his mind, as, of course, Freud must have with his tripartite soul and so on. But But it just goes to show that that these highly educated um, Viennese professionals, yeah, they, they were aware of the, the ancient precedents. And there were moments in the text that totally remind you of Phaedrus with the, the horse metaphor. He doesn't talk about the horse, but he even says things like the one side of the instinctual balance is out of kilter and, and the and and the personality is leaning too far one way and it falls into a, a state of uh, neurosis or um, whatever. And it's just so reminiscent of the, the horseman holding the black horse and the white horse together, you know, in that, in that particular dialogue. It's Phaedrus in there. Is that where it goes? Yeah. So um, very much Plato's in the background. I was kind of hoping Shannon would join us today because I was wondering how much this would resemble a platonic medical account. Mm. Because, and I bring that up because we were having a discussion around how the Hellenistic medical model would look for health within the life of the patient. 
in a way, one of the criticisms of psychoanalysis is it's not particularly concerned with the interests of the patient. It's really postulating these almost alien um, parts of the, the, the psyche which the person has lost contact with. They might as well be um, external entities in some sense. For example, the shadow that Jung brings up is an other you know, with quotation marks, it's it's that other you that's capable of of horrible, horrible things. So, and I find reading this material really unsettling personally because the more I, I sit with it and think about what it means, the more it locates within every one of us a kind of hideous monster, basically. Yeah, which is something that's um, penetrated culture. To the extent that yeah, Jordan Peterson and people like that, you know, they all they all talk about shadow, and it's like, mm, okay, really, is are we taking that as something that's um, established or something that's real, or, or or is it really just some kind of, um, yeah, is it is it a metaphor? Is it a? Um, but I think that would lead us further into the, you know, possibly than we want to go into the whole discussion around personality and subpersonalities. I've had people tell me that subpersonalities are really a thing. You know, it's not just a metaphor. It's not just a way of expressing different aspects of of your of your being in the world. No, no, there are these subpersonalities which are like essentially little little people in your mind, little other little people. Yeah, just. So in some sense, there's this um, instability, I would say, between what's a metaphor and what's a, an image and mm -hmm. what's a, a, a sort of an illustration or a, an example. Yeah, and, and I think Jung's um, perhaps slides over into, into, um, into that, at least as much as the, the other thinkers he's kind of implicitly critiquing here. Yeah, and it's one thing I actually don't like about psychoanalysis is the complexity of the top topography of the psyche because they always do it. Different thinkers get more and more and more complex. They have like a, a round egg for the ego and then they have sometimes these weird kind of circles and squiggles. It just looks like some sort of um, surreal art once they're finished with all these kind of features of the psyche that are split off one from the other and 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 somehow they're supposed to help us to understand how repression works or how unconscious drives are forced into conflict with one another things like that i just find it impossible to imagine that the psyche i, I mean clearly it has to be metaphorical but then again i wonder how much it is metaphorical because clearly the id ego super ego division is a very concrete division they're, they're they are separate different things a bit like the tripartite soul in in plato's um version of the soul which is what you're referencing judith and and i think psychoanalysis especially from freud's point of view is telling the story particularly from the point of view of the appetitive part of the soul and stoicism on the other hand is telling <laughs> telling the story from the superego's point of view of the soul. And of course they don't match up. But of course, again, stoicism doesn't have a tripartite split up. It's a holistic version of the soul, which gets us out of some of the problems that appear in psychoanalysis. Like, for example, if you had a singular united soul, you would be able to make the assumption that reason can penetrate all the deepest, darkest parts of the soul and rational argument would be a suitable therapeutic technique to use against these things because it's all one thing. But in the psychoanalytic description where you've got dark, hidden parts of the psyche that are inaccessible, probably more or less, to other parts of the psyche, then it means that the tools that belong to reason can't necessarily penetrate that discrete boundary between the conscious and the unconscious, for example. So you need these clever psychoanalytic techniques like um, mesmerism or, you know, 
free association and things like that, a different kind of magic, basically, to penetrate into these unknown worlds. And it makes you wonder, are we inventing things when we're doing that? Or, this is where it gets really weird because I feel really stirred up when I think about this stuff and when I think about my own dreams and analyze my own dreams. I start thinking of myself as a as a really bad guy sometimes. And maybe that's good. Maybe maybe that's healthy. But then I often wonder, am I just inventing stuff? Because that seems to be the problem with psychoanalysis, right? Is that it's kind of an absolute theory. The reason you can't prove it is because it's unconscious. Yeah, and so just with the um, the case studies here in this uh, text we've been reading, you know, and it seems to me that, and I think, and and I think Jung actually mentions this at, at one point that um, that there was a problem in in you know upper class, upper middle class society. You know, there, there was a lot of sexual repression. I mean that that's that was a an actual fact of culture at the time. So, you know, again, how much are we looking at cultural uh, phenomena and their kind of direct and indirect outcomes? How much are we looking at that, and how and how much are we looking at innate, um, gen, you know, genetic? Not that they thought in quite in that term, but or, or sort of family situated phenomena there or, or, or so yeah there, there are so many variables to these situations and and one thing I would point to and again this probably you know comes out more more um, clearly in fictional literature of the second half of the 19th century than it does here although again I think probably the the outcome is the same is that but again and and there's a reason I, I think there must be a reason why young women particularly feature in in these accounts is because um, you had uh, women essentially with no function in life other than giving instructions to their servants. <laughs> that was all they had to do all day. <laughs> so I think there must have been some, um, well, I, I know there was, if it, you know, having read, read something about the period, it, there just were negative psychic outcomes from that enforced idleness. And you, you have instances of, women who who whatever you know through whatever circumstances manage to find a, a path in life so Fro Florence Nightingale is is one of them um, she had all these nervous symptoms and you know psychic issues and what but, but then in the Crimean war she found her calling she went out to the Crimea and she essentially instituted military nursing and changed the world <laughs> and so her psychic issues kind of went away and 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 she um, and and her life completely changed. And a, uh, another instance is a, an Australian author or um, English Australian author called Rachel Henning, who came out here in the 1860s in England. Again, upper middle class. All she had to do all day was tell the servants what to cook for dinner. Um, she had all kinds of issues. Came out here. She worked on her brother's property in Queensland. She looked after the animals, and suddenly she had purpose and all her emotional psychic issues evaporated and they were as if they had never been. So it seems to me that a lot of these um, case studies or these, these matters which are being identified as kind of human norms or human constants were actually a product of a particularly uh, unbalanced society, if you like, and particularly for middle class and upper cl middle class women. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, too, and we were reading that uh, Bertrand Russell piece the other week, and I and you hadn't got back yet from holidays, Judith. Um, Vincent, you were there, and we were talking, uh, and even Bertrand Russell brought up uh, about women. We didn't get into it too deeply about the the, uh, the things that he said of women, but he did have quite a few pointed uh, remarks to make about that very thing, the upper classes you know, uh, the women in the upper classes, the ideal of their of them being idle was was a status of, of their wealth. You know, they were expected to be useless. And, it, you know, um, so he did bring that up. And that wasn't even the 1850s. That was even, what, not early 1900s and so forth. Um, so, yeah, and then that, so I agree totally 
with what you're saying about that cultural uh, it's a, it's a, it's a cultural construct the whole that type of uh, neurosis that we're seeing in those women um and and i i don't i don't want to jump too far ahead but it's really uh wonderful that he brings in this whole comparison and how the emphasis on the difference of, of that approach of, of of instinct animal instinct and how instinct as the driver as opposed to the human side and um, and so this idea of shadow and everything uh, seems through the reading of the three essays, I felt like the whole premise of the shadow was associated very strongly with that animal instinct side. And may I just say in closing, <laughs> I don't dream at all. And I would have a real problem <laughs> going to be <laughs> to a Jungian psychologist because I just wouldn't have anything to tell him. <laughs> I've been yeah, I've been having a lot of dreams lately. I I hadn't dreamed for, dreamt for months and months, and then lately I've just been having tons of them. And uh, it was funny last night. I had this weirdest dream, and it made me kind of reflect on it while I was reading the text. And I kept going off on these reveries because I was like, "Is there, is there a kind of conflict, unconscious conflict? What am I hiding from myself?" And I was getting really stirred up. And and I must admit, towards the end, I, I I was getting all these weird feelings. I was feeling kind of because the stoic training, I guess, makes you kind of stand back and watch yourself a little bit. And I was more objective, and I was able to watch my my state change. And I was feeling a bit depressed, <laughs> to be honest. So there's a lot going on, and and it made me think you know what, I really need to get on and get a therapist because um, I've been doing a lot of counselling lately and you're supposed to go and see a therapist with the counselling. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that's interesting. I'll, I'll let you know what happens. And it, and it made me Google. I started looking for a Jungian therapist in prison. So. But I found one, but he's like $200 an hour and that's a lot of money. So we'll see what happens. But going back to what you said, Judith and, and Jody, you know, Viktor Frankl came along uh, after after the war. He survived Auschwitz. Remember, he wrote that book, um, Man's Search for Meaning. And he said that after his experience with the war, he realized that uh, the thing that allowed him and the other people to survive the camp was that they had a purpose. Uh, and he quotes Nietzsche saying, um, give give a person uh, a why and I'll give you a how, basically. So the idea of purpose and meaning becomes central to Frankel's idea for psychoanalysis. And Frankel himself actually says that there are three branches of psychoanalysis or three schools now. And Freud is the will to desire and Adler is the will to power and I, Viktor Frankl, am the will to meaning. So Frankel adds that third stream, whether he's allowed to or not, who knows, he did. It's called logotherapy now, so there you go. But that makes sense, right? So the idea is that um, any of a number of undiscovered um, instincts that lie at the heart of our psyche that go uh, neglected or, um, or kind of repressed for various reasons, will eventually cause unconscious conflicts in our lives. Um, the question it also raises, of course, is if that's really the case, because maybe there's prohibitions in life. You know, I think, Vincent, you mentioned about how the, there's a lot of restrictions placed on, you know, maybe in the past, um, restrictions about what kind of behaviours are appropriate or not, things like that. These kind of prohibitions... Um, um, obviously cause some form of, of conflict. I um, can't remember where I was going to go with that. But the point is, um, on a slightly different note, I'll come back to that because I forgot what I was talking about. What Did you pick up for, about virtue, Judith, in this? There was a, there was a suggestion to, in, in here that Jung was getting at when he was talking about the shadow, that people with extreme forms of ideology for example should be considered suspect because 
um, they had repressed or pushed, broken off the other side of, of the coin, basically, and pushed it down into the unconscious. So he was suggesting, in a sense, that his Christian idea of virtue, at the very least, it's very different from a Socratic form of virtue, his idea of virtue was a pathology, in a sense. Look, I, I totally, if, if that was in the text, I kind of totally missed that. But but I think it's worth, I think you're right to suggest that, um, I mean, I think with Freud, for the first time in, you know, two and a half thousand years, self-control was regarded as part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Um, self-control viewed as repression. Uh, so, yes, I think I think psychoanalysis uh, put the blowtorch to what remained of um, Christian and pagan virtue in culture in a kind of a, an unfortunate way um, and, and took culture in some directions that, yeah, were probably blind alleys. Um, but, but, yeah, probably, I mean, I mean, virtue took a bit of a beating in the 20th century then with the World War One and World War Two and the decline of organised Christianity. But but I think the first blowtorch was from Freud. So, yes, I think that um, was was critical in the decline of um, of what had been conceived as virtue until that point. But I did kind of, if, if that's what Jung's getting at, I kind of missed that in the text. Where, whereabouts would that be, Courtney? I think oh. it's in the uh, Nisha. I think it's in the third chapter, is it? Yeah, when he's talking about Nietzsche, and it got me to bring out my Thus Spake Zarathustra and remember the, the bit where the young, the youth is sitting under a tree looking all troubled and Zarathustra approaches him. Well, he says, um, if I wish to say, shake this tree with my hands, I should not be able to do so. But the wind which we see, which we see not, troubles and bends it as it lists. We are sorest bent and troubled by invisible hands. Thereupon the youth arose disconcerted and said, I hear Zarathustra, and just now was I thinking of him? Zarathustra answered, Why are you frightened on that account? But it is the same with man as with the, as with the tree. The more he seeks to rise into the height and light, the more vigorously do his roots struggle earthward, downward into the dark and the deep, into the evil. Yes, indeed, into the evil, cried the youth. How is it possible that you have discovered my soul? And of course, famously, he says, many a man would not have discovered this soul unless they first invented it, you know? So there's this idea, I think, here that um, morality, right? Uh, and and virtue is a part of that, but not nothing like a Socratic virtue. This is the, the a kind of interesting thing to tease apart. But the end of the Christian era, this kind of Christian virtue, is has become thoroughly decadent, and actually is the soul tipped too far in one direction, and and it must have roots that go deep deep down into the shadow. And this shadow is a kind of noxious, poisonous, uh, I don't know, movement away from what's natural and healthy in that kind of normative sense, but probably not in the normative sense that of the medical analogy that we were talking about before. You know, that all brings to mind the whole, um, you guys are familiar with the yin and yang symbol and how the light and the dark. And so the light represents order and the darkness is chaos and it's not as though one is you know dark is bad and you know chaos is bad and order is good it's actually that uh, too much of either is is not healthy and then you see the small circle in each of them which represents the dark and the light or chaos being seated in the light and vice versa it really it, it seems to me now listening to this that what Jung and Freud were encountering was that chaos that was brought from having this obsessive order, especially as you pointed out, Judith, for women in that social strata. And then, so then going from there, it seems as a, in a way now in, in modern Western society that we're sort of more in the realm, realm of chaos and there's kind of a need in a sense because it's gone, you know, that order, those centuries that were highly repressive and too orderly. And it's gone a little bit the other direction and it's sort of springing from that a need to have order restored a balance you know and that's not as easily available through religion for a lot of people 
that have these secular um, values or maybe an absence of values without religion to prescribe them. So something like Stoicism or some other philosophical method are really there. And the problem, it seems, from psychology is it's it's kind of a Band-Aid, but it's not a whole way of seeing the world. I mean, where's the philosophy in here? It's sort of trying to identify problems and stuff. But, you know, if there's a anxiety brought about by, say, time, which is actually an extension of death, then what psychology got to offer exactly, you know? Um, the thing is, I've got the conch. I'll touch on a few other things, if I may. Um, so, Judith, you spoke about how they sort of identify having lots of different personalities within ourselves. That brings to mind that uh, awesome Pixar movie, uh, Inside Out. So mm -hmm. inside that girl's mind, they have all these different figures. I think there's five, and they represent different emotions. And you see that in the earlier cartoons where they've got the devil and the um, angel on the shoulder trying to take control. So I, I think there's some relevance there. And I also really think that um, this dark side um, is there. And the reason, and it's, you know, Peterson mentions it, but it, it's been well documented before that. And so you can take examples of like Nazi Germany. Now, most of the, a lot of the people that worked in concentration camps or knew what were happening were educated and they were decent people, but they were going along with what was there then. Yeah, sure, they were fed propaganda and stuff. But even to this day, you know, people gravitate to watch movies that are pretty depraved. You know, it's like the Coliseums with these gladiator sports. There's so much violence and stuff on TV and people flock to it. It's always there. And so I'm just breezing over a few things that came to mind in these talks. Another one was, um, yeah, one of the key differences between Jung and Freud, as I as I understand it, one of which was Jung came after him. So he could take everything that Freud had uncovered and evolve it. And he wasn't emotionally invested in it because he didn't uncover it himself. So he could have a more objective view of what Freud had and not be, you know, oh this is mine and i've got to keep this this theory intact but another distinction was that he was an introvert whereas uh freud wasn't so i think freud sort of discounted that world of dreams it wasn't um from what i understand i've heard it wasn't as quite a, a thing for him so it did mean that Jung was able to take his work and move forward and bring in this kind of stuff that is a little bit sketchy and a little bit less specific um and I know that the dichotomy between introversion and extroversion is supposed to be the, the biggest of the big five personality traits. That's one of the, the biggest dis defining differences amongst people. And another one of those five personality traits is something called uh, neuroticism, which is susceptibility to negative emotions. So in this chapter one, when they talk about some people being more affected by these trauma events, that just has to do with your wiring, whether you're naturally more of a nervous person or not like i score quite high on uh, neuroticism personally which means i'm more susceptible to anxiety and depression but looking at the big picture you would want a population that has a mix because people that aren't as neurotic um they're not going to be as aware of dangers that approach the the group or whatever D does that make any sense there's a point, biologically, there's a point to having diversity, not just physically, but in terms of um, our psych. Yeah. So anyway, just a few points. <laughs> um, on that idea of um, different movements from one extreme to the other, you mentioned there, Vincent. I think he mentions the Dionysian a few times in here, especially in relation to Nietzsche's uh, example of the will to power. In fact, he says his Christification, you know, is a form of kind of Dionysian transformation or something like that. Mm -hmm. But Nietzsche is the one, I think, who coins this this um, dichotomy or whatever in his Birth of Tragedy, right? I, I assume it, it's where it appears first, where he, he puts the Apollonian in contrast to the Dionysian. And 
it is really interesting to read psychoanalysis and be interested in virtue ethics on the other side because you've got your Apollonian Dionysian kind of pendulum and that's probably another reason I find it disturbing um of course Christianity is another form of the Apollonian um kind of way of doing life and and so is asceticism so you find forms of asceticism um go hand in hand with Christianity and Platonism and and the Hellenistic kind of schools and and things like that, and and don't you find? Because I know I'm here with an, a group of people who are interested in Stoicism. Don't you find when you read this stuff that it makes you question how Apollonian you are and whether you're a bit of an ascetic, as ascete, sorry, an ascete, mm-hmm. and um and why? And like I know for me in my life, I was incredibly Dionysian. Like I basically was an alcoholic. So um, on the other hand, I've swung to a, a kind of radical extreme. Like, and and I guess that's why it stirs me up because I know that on one hand I could say, well, yeah, of course, those sorts of things are required as as a cure, you know, to an imbalanced soul. But then, then as the person, you have to ask yourself, am I the kind of person who swings from one extreme to another? Is stoicism just another form of extreme? Or can it be something like a healthy approach to, to the soul? You, you know what I mean? I'm not saying it's one or, a, or the other. I just They're the kind of concerns that come up when I start reading this material. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I, I would agree. Like, there is definitely... An- uh, I'm not going to be able to say that word, ascetic sort of personality that I have in some level. And I do sometimes wonder if that's what actually attracts me to stoicism, um, even though I don't accept it anymore. But it definitely seems like that might have been a initial driver, which then was like, well, okay, but was I like rational to actually engage with it in the initial point? Like, was it just I was going off like how my nature or how I was programmed or yeah, or is there actually something there? It is definitely a, it's hard to get out of yourself, like to escape that because it could always be there and you just don't even know. Like you're just so biased in your your view. Like it's the sort of thing, um, yeah, you can't escape. Um, so I've got a bit lost here. What, what is it we're identifying that's in our personalities? Is it? a tendency to um, excessive uh, asceticism, as in A-S-C-E-T-I-Z, you know, uh, um, excessive self-control, I guess. Is that what we're identifying here? Is is that what you're talking about, Shannon, or not? Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Well, yeah, maybe. (laughs) But, yeah, then then you... Sorry, Joe, you go ahead. I, I was just quickly going to say, like, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm in that sort of autumn years, you know, and uh, I can probably easily say that I was probably quite a, I had a more Dionysian approach as a younger person and it's been very easy for me in maturity to find and explore and and um, claim you know the virtue ethics of of stoicism you know it's been a um it was the obvious goal for me you know so yeah but i do see what you're saying there courtney in the dichotomy of one to the other and but 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 that's why it was really fascinating to have this whole thing where he was really going into um you, like you were saying the on page 57 we because we've jumped a bit um, forward to Nietzsche, but when he's talking about the uh, basic attitudes of Christianity, you know, also forfeits the protection which these bestow upon him. He delivers himself up unresistingly to the animal psyche. That is the moment of Dionysian frenzy, the overwhelming manifestation of the blood beast, or blonde, blonde, blonde beast, sorry who seizes the unsuspecting soul, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so that whole thing of the the animal nature 
as opposed to our elevated gift of reason, you know. Um, and I can't see why, you know, in our study of of how we deal with impressions that that those even subconscious impressions that at some point come forward into consciousness, that's that's when we get the opportunity to deal with them with our with our power of reason. Anyway. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and that's a that's an interesting connection to stoicism. Obviously, here in the background, there is a lot of material around how the unconscious is a kind of a psychic force that kind of drives our lives along. So, you know, it sounds like a kind of determinism um, there that there's there's forces around us that are part of us that I guess the Stoics might even call external to us because they're not yet up to us. I wonder, I know it's probably a bit of a stretch to be doing that sort of thing, but it makes you wonder then if a person becomes more aware of what is otherwise unconscious, do they broaden their sphere of what becomes up to them, you know, because the rational capacity, the rational faculty expands to cover more material. Because I'm assuming there's a lot of people that live their lives quite unconsciously, that they're not aware of the things that drive them towards certain desires and so on. Yeah. But, but to work on yourself in that way obviously um, increases your awareness of the kinds of inner forces that are directing you. Do you see what I'm saying? I thought it was really interesting how Jung, and again, I can't quite remember where it is in the text, but he, he does make the point that, you know, you've got Freud's worldview on the one hand and Adler's worldview on the other, and he said, well, where does that leave the therapist, you know? Where, where is that person in the, in the scheme of things? You know, are they also subject to these uh, um, forces that they identify in other people? So that was that was very um, shrewd, I thought, and and quite a palpable hit about about you know where the therapist sits in all this um, speculation around the patient's psyche. Uh, the therapist, presumably by definition, also is subject to a lot of these, um, or perhaps all of these, <laughs> of these conscious and unconscious um, impacts. Yeah, that's a hundred percent because. I was um, doing a bit of a Wikipedia look around uh, the early guys that Jung mentioned, Charcot and Pierre Yanet. And it was Charcot, I think, it was a, either him or the other one, who who noticed the, the special relationship that formed, the special rapport that formed between the client and therapist and how it plays a significant role in, in psychodynamic. That's why it's called psychodynamic, the psychodynamic therapy. And um, apparently that's where the theory for transference comes from. So we've already got established at this point in this discussion of neuroses, the concept of transference between the client and the, well, the patient, they're calling it the patient and the doctor. Later on, they add counter-transference. So it's something that is unconsciously going on between the therapist and the client is, is a sort of, drama where they play out or reenact the kind of unconscious conflict so that sometimes and you'll have seen this in the movies right where the therapist will say something like um do you feel like i'm your father speaking to you right now you know things like that you know so yeah very interesting that um the yeah. therapist well, is not exempt from the drama yeah yeah exactly and and isn't that you know maybe in in another form um the kind of, well, it, it's analogous to the teacher-student relationship that we see in ancient philosophy. You know, it's the, it's the mentor, it's the, it's the mentee. It's, yeah, I mean, I, I think those dynamics must be in play. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, maybe it, this is a, a kind of instantiation of, of the, the kind of um, transformative relationship which ancient philosophy viewed as kind of, critical to the uh to the development of the person yeah and the interesting difference i guess is that 
the reason why psychoanalysts have to undergo such lengthy periods of psychoanalysis and presumably for the rest of their whole life is because if they're not clear about what their unconscious material is, they tend to project it onto their clients. So it's a bit different in that regard from the wise teacher and the passive student, um, because now you've got somebody who is unsure completely whether they're actually talking to their patient or not, or are they talking to the projected desires and unconscious conflicts that they are putting onto the, the patient in and thinking that they're working with the patient, but they're actually working on themselves. You know, this is where it gets really confusing. And and again, why I think psychoanalysis is really a tricky topic because how do you prove any of this? Like, for example, I might say, I was telling Judith today that uh, I was having feelings of contempt for some of the people I was working with in the prison. Um, it was subtle, it wasn't like, I, I don't like the people. I can respect their general humanity, but I noticed that there's a, a subtle feeling of contempt about the choices they made that led them to be in the situation they are. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized there is a kind of thing, a relationship I have with contempt that I've never really owned up to. So, you know, this is the danger of reading this material for me. And, and then and then I thought, um, I thought, yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense why if you were doing this sort of work with people that you would go and, and seek out a, a professional kind of sounding board, another therapist or a psycho, a psychotherapist, because, because what if I'm unconsciously not aware of the fact most of the time that I have contempt at some level for some of my clients? That could be really damaging to the relationship, right? So, yeah, that's that, and and obviously, you know, I bring it up because that that's what's strangely different between, say, therapy and say, philosophy. We're not really worried about doing that in philosophy, that's are we? That, exactly. That's where that's where, like you're saying, the teacher, student, or or the philosopher, um, interlocutor, or you know the that relationship is really different to that of psychotherapy in, in, in the way that it's defined here, you know, really a different relationship. I agree, yeah. I think it's intriguing to think about just how much the subconscious might want to be discovered because if we're looking at, some of these techniques and having an understanding of our own potential biases or, or projection, how unsettling it might be to try and uncover what is lurking beneath the surface for us, or even if it wants to come to the forefront, um, particularly when we're looking at some of the examples from earlier, I was struck by what to me still seems to be this very detailed and like haphazardly connected layer of events so we're looking at the idea of this this person that you know in the subconscious they have their unattained love so what's the shadow doing in the background to prepare themselves so as soon as there's a horse they can bolt they can get to the bridge they can be restrained right there so they can get to their you know unrequainted lover's apartment because that's where it so happens to be like well, the power that's lurking in the background to be able to be on the lookout for the right time to act on these things without us even knowing. Uh, I was really struck by that. Yeah, and that's a wonderful point. And I've got the text right in front of me. So thanks for bringing us back to that because this is exactly where the unconscious in that telling that Travis is giving um, gets spoken of as if it was a devilish spirit. It says, at the farewell party, the evil spirit stepped up to our patient and whispered in her ear, tonight is his alone. Something must happen to you so that you go to his house. And so indeed it happened. Through her own strange behavior, she came to be back at his house and thus she attained her desire. So, you know, that's right, isn't it? There's these 
invisible forces that seem to direct our lives. And sometimes we think, wow, isn't it amazing that I ended up exactly where I needed to be? Is it fate or is it just our own unconscious desires kind of pushing us along? Or even, like, what, the, sorry? Or even what the processing power is, you know, like did, did time stop and then like your subconscious can just process everything that needs to happen now? Or is it just all these different possibilities that are in the back of your mind and then something comes up and away you go? Well, the idea being that there are these powerful instincts under the surface, whether it's love or power or maybe meaning. And if you're not if you're not feeding them appropriately, because maybe, for example, you know, the culture says it's inappropriate you to have affection for a married man or woman or whatever, or, or to be in a same sex relationship or whatever it is, then that urge, this is kind of how the argument is going, is pushing you from within unconsciously so that you happen to find yourself in all kinds of compromising situations, presumably. Yeah, but but again, this um, Mr. A, the, Mr. A and the Mr. B story was so kind of crudely put together. It's like, you know, again, <laughs> a novelist from the same period would do it a lot better. Okay. And so it, in a sense, it's... Um, it, it's it's a bit hard to take seriously. I, I found the whole Mr. A, Mr. B and the horses and the cab and the party and the, it's like, this is a very schematic um, account mm. of, uh, of a human life and her relationships. And yet, um, and yet we're supposed to take as authoritative this, this schematic and crude account in, uh, we're supposed to take it as authoritative in some very important sense uh, when it's just, in a sense, what it's like. I'll tell you what it's like. It's like um, a medieval monk's account of someone, you know, with a with an evil spirit and tempted by the devil. I mean, essentially, that's what it's like. <laughs> it's, it's a very crude rendering of what in the hands of a novelist from the same period would be very subtle and very... Um, very thoughtful so that's why i find it very hard to take seriously these uh these case studies which of course are the raw material of the theories yeah but you know there's two c's that come to play with that the mr a and b thing one is clinical he's not trying to use flowery language or you know kind of be literary about it necessarily and the other is being concise i mean i think that examples fills as a page as opposed to a novel 1200 pages or something although you know potentially that is the whole story that could make a novel from it but i mean i agree it sort of diminishes the patients at least they keep their names intact and reputation you know but i see but what yeah. you're saying judith and i really I, I i'm inclined to agree because it basically turns out the way jung tells it that it's cherry picking because he's like well, if you have a love instinct, the story goes like this. But if you plug in power instead, guess what happens? You get a completely different output. But rather than him go, so maybe we're just uh, making stuff up, he goes, so maybe they're both true. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing is um, the, the, the sort of, um, reverence accorded to Nietzsche. I mean, okay, yeah, you know, Nietzsche's a great writer, obviously, but why should we take, why should any of the, the protagonists here have taken him as a kind of authority about human life? I mean, he was a, he, he wasn't a very, uh, his own life was not what you'd call a successful in, a, in the sense of either power or sexual <laughs> achievement or, or, you know, anything else in a sense. He was a great writer, but what, what, again, why is Nietzsche some kind of authority here? Oh, I think this 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 is not Nietzsche, this chapter, is it? This is still um, looking at psychoanalysis under Freud's ideas, isn't it? Are we still in num? Oh, we're one? jumping. We're jumping around. It's oh, right. sorry. Yeah. No, 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 that's fine. But you're right, Judith. But, you know, um, uh, Jung makes that point, right? He says that Nietzsche is a failure. He's like a kind of abject failure to to actually deliver the the message he's trying to put forward. He says he captures one aspect of that instinct, the erotic instinct, which is the 
the will to power, presumably, but he completely fails in the other regard, which is presumably something like um, that part that wants to create a unity with the rest of the species. And Jung says, in that regard, he's he hates humanity. He's a complete failure in that respect. And that's why he's so sickly and we shouldn't look up to him. He's a kind of, he's a, his message is true in a sense, but but he, he's not the one who can actually kind of carry it out. You know, it, yeah, that's, I, that's how I, I read it, that. Yeah, I see it as quite a strong critique of Nietzsche, you know, because the way he brings up the relationship with Wagner and uh, looks at that and um, compares the two um, through the story of Faust. And, but um, just, yeah, so I, I didn't see him as putting Nisha on any sort of pedestal. He was really quite um, strongly um, pulling him to bits. Well, uh, but okay. You, I mean, I, I see your point there, Jodie, but may, maybe in that sense... <laughs> I suppose what he's responding to is the influence of Nietzsche in culture at that time, right? So that's, you know, that that's what's again mo most um, most surprising in a sense, but also confronting because, as we know, you know, Nietzsche if Nietzsche had an influence on culture, it probably wasn't a particularly <laughs> particularly good one. So yeah, I mean that, that's kind of the concerning part in a way. Um, but also, um, and maybe Shannon would like to comment on this because we've been discussing this on and off in uh, in Facebook. You know, is 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 Nietzsche's failure as a human being uh, any disqualification for him for being a uh, crit critic of life? Yeah, if if I was being like, I, I wouldn't think so, because um, it's the quality of his arguments that's what makes him so interesting to engage with. Is that there is like this force both rhetorically and logically um, with his arguments. So like him, him having failings, I think it's like, it's a fun point to make, like um, rhetorically that like his life was such a mess. And like, and I feel sometimes it's overstated where uh, not, like I said, I, I didn't read the, the writing um, uh, young, but like some people will be like, Oh yeah, it was, uh, Nietzsche's philosophy that drew him, drew him crazy, like that seems a bit of a, a bit of a stretch. But yeah, to me that would be to get to your point. But be separate. I think it's really important to um, you know be mindful of the psychology of a particular philosopher and understand how that's going to frame their thoughts as as best they try to be objective or whatever. And that includes the quality of their life. You know, I mean, didn't Nietzsche walk around? He had a pretty solitary life walking in the mountains. He suffered from, was it syphilis or something like that? He wasn't successful in love and didn't get a family of his own. I mean, it was it's pretty impressive that he just didn't kill himself or, you know, take it out on society. Um, but anyway, I think that it's helpful to understand that's his back. When he was writing, that's his backstory. That's his context. And then you can look at some other philosopher who, I don't know, say like Karl Marx, who had a family and stuff and how that affected his view. And then going beyond that to looking at their individual psychology, irrespective of those circumstances. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Like, I think there is something interesting to consider his failings in love. But I think it's also a hard thing to balance. Like taking, for example, his failings in love, like he ha obviously has some pretty harsh things to say about women. Um, and like, it's very easy to just be like, oh, he's just jaded. But there are people who are successful in love that do have those sort of viewpoints um, on women. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's, yeah, it, like, I guess like all sort of historical things, it's a hard balancing act between how much we read um, into their internal desires and thinking. But of course it's going to be important for a, a psychoanalyst because he's saying that Nietzsche, his philosophy is the product of his unconscious life, you know? So if he gets it wrong, it's a symptom of, of disturbance, basically. So Nietzsche's life has all the hallmarks of 
of psychological disturbance. And, and if you're a psychoanalyst, you can't separate the two. You would say, well, they're the unconscious conflicts within his nature have manifested in his catatonic state, for example, and are equally present in his lack of ability to unify the, the kind of, um, I don't know, disparate forces in his argument. And, and like, basically, the way in which Jung kind of, you know, and this is pointing towards what you were saying earlier, Judith, that he is aware of culture. He's aware of how it culture um, changes over time and has different prohibitions and different restrictions that it places on people and therefore results in different kind of um, unconscious conflicts, albeit obviously it's the same um, particular instinctual drives that are the topic here. But he says um, pathogenic conflict is a personal matter. So it, it appears in the individual. But it is also a broadly human conflict manifesting itself in the individual. But disunity within oneself is the hallmark of a civilized man. So the neurotic is only a special instance of the disunited man who ought to harmonize nature and culture within himself. So somehow there's, there's this complete lack of balance or harmony between nature and culture and we know from Nietzsche um, and probably Freud that they've distanced themselves radically from what was mostly the dominant kind of religious culture of around that time you know Nietzsche famously says God is dead we've killed him and and all that sort of stuff and he wants to tear it out by the roots basically he wants to find a new way to live by rejecting all of our western morality as if it was just um something that society imposes upon us and somewhere in here jung says we have to be really careful when we're talking about morality because if we were to chuck it out altogether that would just be we'd all become libertines anything would go right and he says what well, we have to be careful with then he even says and and psychoanalysis has to be careful about this is that morality has been with us since the beginning and in fact without it we can't have any civilization we wouldn't be able to collaborate and make groups together and stuff like that he says he says the problem is that the groups have just gotten um, a little bit too big um, and there's like other minority outside groups who are trying to join in and so on. And there's, you know what I mean? He, he has this other thing going on. But but my point, my point being, of course, that Nietzsche in particular is somebody who's attempting to disrupt the worldview of his age. And Jung's analysis of this is that he's done some harm to his soul in the process. And that maybe he's on the right track about certain things, like freedom from certain prohibitions, but you can't rip the whole thing out and throw it in, throw it over, you know, throw it away and have nothing suitable to replace it. We we need we need these things in order to be psychically healthy. And I think Nietzsche could could get away with it because he was asocial he was a total hermit living by himself in the mountains and you know even if his viewpoints were anti-social then did it matter i mean he was writing books and sending letters only and then he had no fear of the repercussions in an afterlife because he didn't believe in it his own existence now was probably paramount to hell you know yeah he'd stop it. But but that's a, that's all just sim symptomatology of of his disturbance, according to Jung. Like, and again, I I think the Stoics have a better account again because the Stoics, of course, can have their reason and they can still participate and they can still love other people because they found a more moderate um, ability to balance out all these different variables. I'm actually curious as to the depth of criticism that we can apply and and if it has a higher weighting when we're talking about psychoanalysis 
because if we're thinking about the Stoics, for example, we've got Seneca with his own Stoic teachings and philosophy that in some ways has been argued as fallen short with his involvement with the Emperor Nero, but then we can separate the two. But then if we're looking at Nietzsche, for example, of who I know nothing, but just listening here, um, it seems like it's more difficult for us to decouple the theory put forward in the person because you'll have all of these things in the in the subconscious that are potentially coming into the theory that's being put forward. I just just curious. Well, you're right, comments. and you know, people like Freud, Jung, and Nietzsche are all interested in these unconscious forces. Um, I, I will say that. Um... <laughs> Allow me to defend Seneca. Uh, you know, I think he gets a bad press for um, perhaps insufficient reasons. Uh, I think, and 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 only in brief, um, that the whole situation with Nero and Agrippina would have been a lot worse without Seneca and Boris doing what they did. Oh, yes. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think with Nietzsche, I think inevitably uh, the works stand for the man and, and bits Simply because we have we have ample literary as well as biographical information about him, so we we are in a position to judge. I think in a in a way even more than we are as a, 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 even we are, than we are with Seneca a, about his overall contribution. Um, and but I think what's interesting here is that that Jung sees him sees Nietzsche in the round. You know, he sees him as a man and as a writer. So that's really interesting, um, and and appre and sort of appreciates his his overall contribution uh, in in both in both settings, um, but but in a sense still you know uh, I, I suppose I'm a little surprised that the extent to which which Jung um, pays attention here to Nietzsche as, and, and I suppose that's a reflection of the extent to which Nietzsche was an influence in culture and, and if just going back a step I don't know if you if anyone looked as, as I did at the, at the numerous prefaces to the different editions of this work you know there was the first edition the second edition the third the fourth the fifth going right into the 1920s which kind of suggests that not only um not only was was this work very popular but but that um it was still responding to elements in culture, and that probably reflects um, the influence that Nietzsche had. And Nietzsche is definitely very important to to Freud, right, and and his writings. And I assume it has a lot to do with the. I don't know much about this. You guys will know more about this, but the ideals of the German state at the time prior to the war, right? They saw themselves as, I'm not big on the history, but something about as a new country, they wanted to be this, um, bring all this, the new science together and a new way of understanding humanity. Hence, eugenics was so interesting to them and things like that. Well, it's unquestionable that nature had... Um a huge influence and not a good influence on culture in in regards like that you know to do with um you know there there are passages in nature about uh exterminating the the less capable and you know there's there's no question about that there's no question that he was an influence in the culture that we later associate with the nazis in terms of um extreme eugenist mm -hmm. uh influence so yeah that's that's what's completely disturbing about all this is is nature was obviously a eugenist and he you, had that th you, in sorry to interrupt you um in the terms of of the alleged sisters interference with the work and cherry picking um passages for use for publication is that so that the sister was in um, yeah, I, I, in... I believe it was. I'm not. I'm not a nature specialist at all. But but I believe his sister was key, um, and her own views were were even more extreme than his, as far as I understand it. 
but but there was plenty of material already in his work to to support extreme eugenist ideas about um, extermination of the unfit, which obviously you know were put into practice later on. Yeah, he his works were definitely um, manipulated by the sister, like the um, the will to power, and like a lot of the later essays after he had his mental breakdown. Um, it's not necessarily that they don't have nature within them. And like, I, I agree with Judith that there is definitely, it's not like, you know, he was a cuddly teddy bear. Um, there wasn't like, uh, yeah, he, his sister definitely pushed it a lot further, but, but there was definitely something where you could, it, it was easy to manipulate his philosophy in that way or his writings in that way. Just out of my own interest, is that through a historical like accounting that there was the influence, or did the sister as well also have writings and and they, it was shown to have yeah, a lot so, of similar style later on? Yeah, so uh, basically, um, Nietzsche had like a mental breakdown. Um, I can't remember the exact date, but like say it was like ten years before he died, and then his sister took over his writing, and Nietzsche had explicitly told her. Like, I do not want you to control my writing um, and all these sort of things. Like he had a big falling out with her, which was to do with the, uh, like, obviously it wasn't at that point, but the, the, the Nazi-esque uh, nature of his sister. So he did have like disagreements with her. And so she then um, took his writings and uh, like his notes and stuff and published them. Um, so for example, like Will to Power was a, a work that Nietzsche um, never finished and his sister sort of uh, manipulated but there were other sh smaller works um, and he would also his sister would also have like um, when uh, German officials were visiting and stuff like that like he would um, she would take them in to see Nietzsche who was like comatose like he was just um, sort of like an empty uh, shell like yeah so it was pretty pretty average end to his life but I think Jadis is is on the money i thought i was going to put my um 10 cents in anywhere because even jung calls he 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 uses the quotation blonde beast here remember jody in mm. that section you read out and and the yeah. blonde beast is a pretty brutal kind of uh aryan um ideal that nietzsche talks about and it's also something that the german nazis were, were interested in and and jung makes a point of mentioning it here so and yet uh nietzsche and adolf hitler neither of them were these blonde you know northern european beauties they were these weedy brunettes right so why would they go along with it I, I posted a, a podcast around the history of eugenics recently on the on the Facebook page, and I listened to it. And apparently around that time, there was a general theory, you know, this kind of Darwinist kind of stuff was arising at the time. And there was a theory that there were two superior races in the world. And one was called the Aryan race, the Ultima Fuel, and that was the, the Nordic blood. And the other were the Semitic races. And so... There were theories about um, which one was going to, you know, win and take over the world, basically. Obviously, the Germans thought they had more Teutonic blood and, and thought themselves the worthy um, kind of recipients of the Aryan heritage and, and so were going to stop the, the, the Jews from taking over the world, basically. But I think... It is worth pointing out that he did also praise the Jews a lot within his work um, in some, at least like commentaries that I read as the purpose was to undermine this anti-Semitism to some extent. Yeah, yeah like I think you're right, Shannon. There, there are comments. He wasn't specific. He wasn't particularly anti-Semitic himself at all. So, um, so that was kind of ironic that his um, work later became, was employed in the service of, of an anti-Semitic um ideology but but at the same time there were certainly elements that also were used like this um idea of the extermination of the you know unfit and so on that but yeah so but and also it's worth making the point that around 1900 or 1910 um 
you know, there were plenty of people in Britain and America who were also eugenists. I mean, it was it was a thing. Uh, it, it wasn't just the Germans and it wasn't just the Nazis. It was it was widespread in culture, um, and and there's a whole raft of reasons for that. But but yeah, that's worth pointing out as well. And the English also apparently Winston Churchill um, was a fan of the eugenic movement. Uh, he tried to pass a, a bill in the parliament to enforce um, sterilization in I can't remember what cases, but it was rejected. <laughs> you know, so they were all playing around with these ideas. And that goes back to the uh, ancient Spartans, right? Right? Isn't that what they did with deformed infants? That they would just leave them to die, so they would. Yeah, just filter out the babies that were unhealthy. And then those that were healthy enough, they set them loose in the wild, wasn't it? That like nine or um, ten and look, there's some there's quite a lot of debate around what the actual facts were in terms of how the ancient Greek states dealt with um dealt with uh congenital disability. So yeah, I, I think it's a little bit more complex than we might think. Hmm. Um so yeah, I, I wouldn't want to comment except to say that there's there's possibly some um, oversimplification in in the popular ideas around that. And and because the time's getting on, I just wanted to bring us back to one thing that I thought was kind of interesting. I'm on page uh, forty three, where um, Jung praises Freud's method in one particular respect. He says, but the most important method of getting at the pathogenic conflict is, as Freud was the first to show, through the analysis of dreams. And, you know, Freud thought of dreams as the royal road to the unconscious. And what he's described in the first one and a half chapters is, is there was a, a progression of from Yane and Charcot and Freud to try to work out what the best way to it was to uncover the unconscious, because obviously, if you can't see it and you can't, you can't, you can't make it conscious by thinking about it. How do you how do you catch it in in practice? How do you find it? And the interesting, it's really interesting the whole idea of dream analysis. Um, I posted an article, I haven't actually read it yet, but it looked quite interesting about the history of dreams. Um, I think you saw it, Judith. But um, throughout history, dreams have always been important. And he makes that point here. He says, it is only in modern times that the dream, this fleeting and insignificant looking product of the psyche, has met with such profound contempt. Formerly, it was esteemed as a harbinger of fate, a portent, a comforter, a messenger of the gods, now we see it as an emissary of the unconscious, whose task is to reveal the secrets that are hidden from the conscious mind, and this it does with astounding completeness. The manifest dream, i.e. the dream as we remember it, is in Freud's view only a facade which gives us no idea of the interior of the house, but on the contrary, carefully conceals it with the help of the dream sensor. If, however, while observing certain technical rules, which he obviously doesn't mention here, we induce the dreamer to talk about the details of this dream, it soon becomes evident that his associations tend in a particular direction. So the interesting thing here, and this is where a lot of modern dream interpreters don't obviously haven't read Freud, is you can't just read the unconscious from the symbols. It doesn't work that way. It's been cleansed of the unconscious material, and that's how it works. It's sort of like the curious absence of certain messages indicates the presence of those messages, so to speak. So, for example, you know, he he has he he talks about the woman, right, in the story. Does anyone do you do you remember how that goes? It's something about um, oh. The woman yeah. who dreamed about her mother dying or something. That's right. Yeah. Can you remember yeah. how it goes? She obviously loved her mother, right? Yeah. But in the dream, where is that? Hmm. Ah, here we go. So it basically says, this is on what page, page 44. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, just find where it starts. For instance, a daughter loves her mother tenderly, but dreams to her great distress that her mother is dead. Freud argues that there exists in this daughter, unbeknown to herself, the exceedingly painful wish to see her mother removed from this world with all speed because she has secret resistances to her. Even in the most blame, blameless daughter, such moods may occur, but they would be met with the most violent denial if one tried to saddle her with them. So you obviously couldn't tell her your theories. To all appearances, the manifest dream contains no trace of wish fulfillment rather of apprehension or alarm consequently the direct opposite of the supposed unconscious impulse but we know well enough that exaggerated alarm can often and rightly be suspected of the contrary so there's that role of the the exaggerated opposite. appearance yeah yeah it. so couldn't the dream be just she you know she feared her mother dying i mean wouldn't that be the obvious interpretation why, why would you assume that there was a yet another layer with a wish that her mother died? Wouldn't it, you know, I, I, I don't understand that inference. Mm. And that's how this stuff goes, right? There's this, and it makes it almost impossible to argue against them in a kind of satisfyingly rational way because they're saying, of course you can't see it because the internal sensor has erased it. <laughs> And, you know, they have an interesting oh. theory. They say if the unconscious was allowed to intrude into your dreams and, and make itself visible to the dreamer, it would constantly wake you up with these frightening images. So we've evolved this uh, capacity and an inner sensor to erase the kind of disturbing material. So the clever analyst is looking for the absence of something. Because the story does go on. If you go on to 45, um, then it's brought out that the story is basically about this idea with the daddy. You know, when mm. mummy dies, will you marry me? Won't you, daddy? Right? So it's really getting into some pretty weird stuff. So, so this expression of an infantile wish is the substitute for a recent desire to marry a desire, in this case, painful to the dreamer for reasons still to be discovered. But, but this whole thing of the getting you know getting rid of the mother or or, or or stepping in the place of the mother and um to have that relationship with the father but it's kind of assumed that that's the ultimate desire isn't it i mean it, that's been imposed on the data to an extent mm, it's like many different ways you can interpret it like you could say that you know if we're taking the hidden desire for the mother to be gone it could be so that she can fulfill her wish of marrying the unobtainable or that wasn't that was frowned upon you know it's interesting but it's even a big leap you know if we mm, were to massive. be really really critical to say that she wanted to kill her mother anyway or that she wanted some harm to be done to her mother but obviously this is the idea of the uh of the unconscious uh, instincts, the erotic and the um, aggressive instincts that Freud talks about, um, they are pre-moral in a sense. So we have this superego that we've inherited from the culture and from our upbringing that tells us, no, no, you must love your mother and father, you must be a good daughter, you must do all these things. Freud and Nietzsche, in a sense, are saying this is just conventional morality. This stuff is just rules. This is a set of laws that have been, um, that we're told that we must follow, otherwise we'll be punished. And Freud and Nietzsche, in a sense, are saying, well, they're, they don't belong to us. They're not inherent in us. They're imposed upon us, uh, uh, upon us by, by those who seek to control us. If we wanted to be healthy, they're kind of getting at, we should be free to be our own people and to exercise our own will. And this is where this is a really interesting and problematic kind of theory. And that's what Jung's saying. He's like, whoa, 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 let's be careful because we need moral structures. We can't just say that they're all, you know, imposed upon us. 
But that's exactly what Nietzsche was sort of saying. They're imposed upon us. Let the genius be the one who dictates the rules. Let the blonde beast, the most powerful one, the the fierce kind of warrior, um, dominate and and crush under his boot anyone who gets in his way. That sort of idea. Um, who wants to live in that world? <laughs> you know what I mean. Everybody's there just to serve the needs of 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 the the most powerful and i think judith and i were talking a while ago about how similar nietzsche's argument was to Callicles in in the in the gorgias because it's the idea that the one who has the power to take whatever his want he wants is naturally justified to do so and that's kind of what nietzsche was getting at and jung here is saying no 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 Freud and and Nietzsche with their obsession with one aspect of 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 the um, basic drives are missing the importance of the the full scope of of the human experience. I assume that Jung's going to bring in something much more religious and much more open minded. That's going to talk. I'm I'm totally guessing. You can get that he wants to say something like, no, no, human beings are much more than that. We're not just angry aggressive sexual drives we we actually have some sort of noetic self or some spiritual thing going on well i thought it was really interesting sorry just i just want to say on page 46 here where jung says with regard to this view i've long adopted the standpoint that the occasional occurrence of incest is no proof of a universal tendency to incest any more than the fact of murder proves the existence of a universal homicidal mania productive of conflict. Mm. Uh, and so that was a, a really interesting general point that Jung's making against Freud's kind of worldview. I would not go so far as to say that the germs of every kind of criminality are not present in each of us, but there is a world of difference between the presence of such a germ and an actual conflict with its resulting cleavage of the personality, such as exists as a neurosis. So Jung's saying here, you know, <laughs> however um, correct Freud may be around some of these tendencies, it doesn't mean that we're all constantly wanting to, you know, sleep with our parents or or murder them. I mean, and and that's a, I mean, it seems obvious, but it, but apparently that had to be said. <laughs> Because, because I did you want to say something, Vincent? Because I, I, before I just like us to. We've only got about fifteen minutes left, and there's a really good story in that third chapter from about sixty one on, and with the point about his attitude to love and Adla, he's bringing Nisha, uh, Nisha's um, will to power, and bringing Adler's view in with this particular story of this woman. Was there anything you wanted to add there, Vincent, before we... It's, a, it's just a real quick thing, just that, um, you know, going back to individual philosophers and their own psychology, like, it just appears obvious to me from that example that Jung's just more of an agree... He's more agreeable on one of those those big five traits. He's more agreeable, whereas uh, Nietzsche and Freud are less so. So that's just something to do with their... And it's interesting, I mean, with Nietzsche, there's there's not that much need to be agreeable because he doesn't have to compromise social situations to the extent that Jung does. He's not immersed in society, but Freud is. Um, but he still uh, has very, you know, very strong opinions and, and is kind of quite disagreeable. Yeah, sorry, that's all I wanted to say. <clears throat> because, you know, so this story continues, this story about this woman continues and he goes on more about it in this third essay and brings in, as I say, Adler's um, ideas about the will to power as well um, to further Nietzsche's uh, views. And on 61, it starts um, down the bottom, um, a story of something that happened to her before she was married. She was staying at the health resort in the mountains and uh, there was a young Italian who, who played particularly well and who also knew how to handle a guitar and it's et cetera. So this, the, flirt, the flirtation developed. Anyway, in this story, I don't read the whole lot, but but because she's having this in, interlude with this Italian and he freaks her out a bit by making a pass at her or something, and then it reminds her of he, her being with the father at a concert where a 
um, a woman of the night um, accosts the father and she sees this same interaction between the father and this woman and it triggers all this stuff, right? So she's got all this stuff triggered and it goes on and on to go back into um, the, the very intricate relationship with the father and, and going on and on and on about that. Um, and then in, at 65, though, at 65, in the middle of 65, it says this, um, the disillusionment of the mother and her withdrawal, because the mother was neurotic as well. And she was mirroring that she was, she was copying the mother's neurosis to, to gain her own ends in the end. Anyway, it says that love and good behaviour are, from the standpoint of the power instinct, known to be a choice means to this end. So it's a power, it's a, it's a way of achieving power through love. Um, and this is the claim here, which I hadn't come across before. And it says, um, yeah, love and good behaviour are, from the standpoint of the power instinct, known to be a choice means to this end. Virtuousness often serves to compel recognition from others. Already as a child, the patient knew how to secure a privileged position with her father through especially ingratiating and affectionate behaviour, et cetera, right? So this whole thing here about her use of the love relationship as a way to achieve power. And then it goes on. Uh, so he talks about that. So, and finally, is, it, is not this the way of nature herself? Is disinterested love at all possible? This is at the bottom of 65. And then um, it goes on to say, um, the Hoffman's Tale, the Devil's Elixir, brings in a few other um, cultural uh, references. And then... But at the bottom of that section, Jody, it says, and I think this is a good point, Perhaps there is in general a tendency to think as little as possible about the purpose of love. Otherwise, we might make discoveries which would show the worth of our love in a less favourable light. Yes. And that's interesting. We don't talk about uh, no, love we much don't. in psych psychology. No, we, see love, like we see love as the totally elevated, you know, one, uh, the goal of all of life is to, um, you know, that love, the Bible tells us, you know, it's all about love. Yeah. Um, and you know, but, but then, it could very well be the case that, um, you know, if we looked closely at it, we might find that it has a deep relationship with things like power. Yeah. Mm, mm, not just Eros, but power as well. And then I'm, and I just wanted us to look at that very last paragraph. Can I read it? Just 55. Yeah. So this is how it finishes. And then we can go back to talk about other stuff. But this is how the final part of the, the, the essay finishes. Which of the two points of view is right? That is a question that might lead to much brain racking. One simply cannot lay the two explanations side by side, for they contradict each other absolutely. In the one, the chief and decisive fact is Eros and its destiny. In the other, it is the power of the ego. In the first case, the ego is merely a sort of appendage to Eros. In the second, love is just a means to the end which is ascendancy. Those who have the power of the ego most at heart will revolt against the first conception, but those who care most for love will never be reconciled to the second. It's just a really powerful ending to the essay, you know? Mm. Anyway. Well, it is, but it's also a gross oversimplification of human life. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, either ego or love. <laughs> yeah, like, correct. It, yeah, it's ego or love. Oh, yeah, there's, there's, it's not an either or here. It, no. You know, human life is a great deal more complex than those two binaries. That that's the whole point. It's like, and and he kind of gets that, but at the same time, he presents them as um, exclusive alternatives. Which you know, again, the novelists knew that they weren't. Life, you, life you is know, more complex than that. Do you know why you would say that, Judith? It's because men are from Mars and women are from Venus. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but here, but here, the the woman is is the one using love in, in, to it to gain to gain power 
so it's interesting, isn't it? You know, like if you want to yeah. put the dichotomy of male female into it. <laughs> but but the you know the the kind of the um the key point of that anecdote was apparently the woman laughed at the news of her father's death. It's like like all this significance has been placed on this one little action or kind of involuntary reflex in a way it's like you know this massive significance is being and and a whole raft of explanation has to be adduced for why she laughed when her at the news of her father's death and it's like oh okay okay you know it seems to me that the you know again this you know <laughs> sometimes the the emphases are kind of in the wrong place but that's a very peculiar feature of psychoanalysis is that they notice all the, the little unconscious, uh, they, they think it's the unconscious coming to the surface. For example, Freudian slips, you know, when you accidentally say the wrong thing and um, like tickle your ass with a feather. Oh, sorry, I mean, it's particularly nasty weather, you know. Sorry, it was a Freudian slip, you know, that kind of idea. <laughs> but but they think that they're very serious uh, signs that the unconscious is trying to peek through. So it's a very peculiar theory. Um, but also that's really kind of, you know, isn't that exactly like the ancient, you know, the ancient would say that the, you know, the, the way a bird looked at a piece of food or whatever is, was kind of significant, you know, that this is massive significance adduced to these miniature events. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that. And in some ways, you're right. I think it does smack of uh, magical thinking. You know, I think that it's no wonder that Jung is interested in alchemy and magic and stuff like that. It's 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 not a great leap away from all that sort of material. But I think it's important to you know consider that when Jung was talking with these patients, they'd have many many sessions over you know big stretches of time and and maybe they're just using individual examples here but the context of a, um, a patient's relationship with their father or whatever would be fleshed out over those sessions potentially and they're just using sort of cherry-picked examples here to make a point i could be wrong you know as you say it, it could well be that um they're overplaying the whole freudian slip idea and and the you know the um unconscious appearing in these sort of um unusual reactions and i mean how shit i'm worried about how i'm going to react at my father's funeral when that day comes you know i'm scared that i won't be able to cry on cue or whatever and shit people laughing or having different reactions at a situation like that you know it's it's tricky mm. yeah i knew a girl that accidentally laughed at her dad's funeral and then, and it was weird because I read this stuff and I go, oh, that happened to a friend of mine. <laughs> and she was really like upset about it. Uh, later on, she was like, I don't know what came over me. I, I was laughing. Uh, couldn't, couldn't work it out. Maybe it's just a really common human reaction, you know. What's like off that Joker movie? He's got that little card, you know. He's got to show people laughing at the wrong times. Mm. <laughs> Anyway, that was a really wonderful conversation. I thought we'd struggle with that because I had a pretty um, foggy head, but we I think we pulled it off pretty well. Do you guys want to have some closing statements? Um, anyone? Go first. I, I thought it was a really great text and I thought the um, amount of reading was appropriate, perhaps not like the Nussbaum where obviously didn't get across the enough material in the time. So, yeah, if we can um, do a, a similar amount for next time, that'd be great. And thanks, Courtney, for guiding us today. It's been great. Any other notes? Vincent, Travis, Jody? Yeah, that no, was really um, really interesting, like, just to hear text. I, I will try and um, give it a read. Hmm. Yeah, super interesting always interesting to hear other perspectives but good good text at least the the parts i was able to read um but yeah keen for the next one yeah i think it was a great talk um and it's awesome to um you know go um go into a bit of psychology as well as philosophy and then um obviously literature as well and it, it's great to go uh, from one to the other but also to bring the other two to whichever is the focal point in this case psychology and, and be able to use those literary contexts and also um, 
say modern media you know like film and stuff and then philosophy and, and history lessons too it's all very important to bring them all together to um really get some depth of understanding there yeah yeah thanks everyone you really facilitate my learning so i really love that we all bring so many different kind of skill sets and you know knowledge to the to the to what we're doing um i i was surprised i haven't read much hardly any Jung actually before so i i found it very approachable and i look forward to reading more i think um i will read the rest of this in the next few days so it it'd be funny to have um ha would to have had the uh the the answer you know to have wouldn't it wouldn't have been funny to have Nietzsche be able to to critique Jung <laughs> or, or Freud you know critique Jung. Like it's just um yeah he, he was it was interesting to hear such a giant in um in our in our popular culture to you know sort of critiquing two other giants. You know, I, I know yeah. what Freud would say. He'd say, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, but <laughs> yeah. sometimes a dick is a dick and Jung is a big fat dick. <laughs> On that note. But what chapter are we doing for Nussbaum? Is it chapter two or are we going yeah. to try and finish chapter one? Uh, chapter two. Chapter two. Okay. All right. Have a good night, guys. Oh, good night. See Bye -bye. you later.